from a technological glitch, as often is the case. And I often, uh, at my PowerPoint presentation, it would have been so good. Y'all just would have been so impressed with it, but we're going to struggle through. And I, I often start my topics with a joke or some humor, but I want to be very deadly serious for a moment. Judge Brogdon, studio audience, those of you out in remote locations, remember the case with the drunk Exxon driver and the four horribly mangled children? Well, I have handled tire blowout cases. I have handled tractor trailer tanker cases. I have handled brain injury cases. Call me. I'm here for you. Wouldn't it be great in cross-examination if you could do what all our clients want to do as they sit there and whisper to you, he's lying, he's lying, just to stand up, say, liar, liar, pants on fire? Well, we can't do that. But that's the focus of what I want to talk about, because impeachment by cross-examination, that's what jurors remember. Nobody says, oh, he was a great lawyer. Uh, remember, what a powerful direct examination. Nobody remembers that. What a great impeachment he did. What a great examination he did. First thing I want to do is talk a little bit about cross-examination in general. I want you to think about yourself as theater. When you are cross-examining, think about where the focus of the juror's attention should be. 95% of the time, it should be on you because the questions in cross-examination are more important most of the time than are the answers. So be in a position in the courtroom where the jury will be looking at you. And if we were uh, had the PowerPoint presentation, this would have some action to it. But what I'm talking about is you want to be in a position where the jury is looking at you, where in direct you might stand behind the jury box. Here you're going to be here. When we talk about some of the impeachment techniques in a little while, there may be times when you want the jury to focus directly on the witness. And when you do that, think about where they're looking. They're going to be looking at the voice. They're going to be looking at you. If you stand behind them, they're going to be looking at the witness. If you stand in front of them, they'll be looking at you. There's been a lot of writing on cross-examination. I think all of us had seen the tapes or maybe were lucky enough to see in person Professor Irving Younger during his lifetime tell us about the nine methods of impeachment. Well, I saw him. I actually had the privilege of seeing him give that speech live, and it was very exciting. But I can't really remember him. There wasn't an acronym. So I was thinking about this paper, and I thought, what's a good acronym? How do you decide whether to impeach? even do a cross-examination. Because remember, when you begin a cross-examination, the def party that had asked the questions, they're concluded. Very, very rarely can they say, oh, I forgot one. But when you do a cross-examination, they will be allowed to redirect. And even though they're supposed to keep their redirect to the confines of your cross, almost every judge will let them go a little broader than that. So think about that. That's one of the great reasons why you don't do it. The other great reason why you don't do it is if they haven't hurt you, just doesn't, don't do that. So I thought of this acronym, hi-ho. Hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to cross-examine, I go. And what I'm talking about here with hi-ho is to think of this acronym, H. Has the witness hurt you? If they haven't hurt you, why cross-examine them? I, has the, is the witness impeachable? Have they said something that has hurt you that you can impeach? The other H for ho, can the witness help you? And lastly, is there some other really good reason? Unless you have a strong yes to one of these questions, then hi ho, hi ho, sit down, not off to cross examine you go. I want to. Um, talk about cross a little bit more with respect to technique, and then we're going to focus more on the impeachment aspect of it. When you're cross-examining, lead. Let me roll the first tape here, which is a scene from The Rainmaker, showing how not to direct, the point being lead on cross, not on direct, because when you do it on direct, you don't have any rhythm, and you become the witness instead of who you want to be the star. If we can roll the first piece. Now, Mrs. Black. You are the mother of Donnie Ray Black, who recently died of acute myosolytic leukemia because the defendant great benefit. Objection. Leading. 
sustained. Your son, Donnie Ray, needed an Objection. operation. Leading. Sustained. Mrs. Black, did you purchase this medical policy because you were concerned about medical care Objection. for your son? I'm sorry, Your Honor. Obviously, he had no rhythm at all there. That was his very first witness, the very most important witness. Point being, leading has a place, but it's not on direct. Now I want to show you about the importance of making sure that when you are on cross, you do lead, because if you don't, bad things can happen. Let's roll the next. Turn it off. Mrs. Black, uh, why did you sue Great Benefit for $10 million? Is that all? Beg your pardon? I thought it was more than that. Is that so? Yes, sir. Your client has about a billion dollars, and your client killed my son. Hell, I wanted to sue for a whole lot more. What would you do with uh, the money if this jury awards you $10 million? What are you going to do with the money? I'm going to give it to the American Leukemia Society. Ever since. That was how he started the cross-examination. So his cross-examination started about as rough as the direct did. The point there being lead. If you ask open-end questions, only bad things can happen most of the time. I'm going to give you one more example of how not to do a cross-examination. This is from a civil action. Um, John Travolta plays a lawyer, Jan Flickman. It's a true story. I, had the privilege of talking with Jan where we were on a panel like this at an ATLA convention that, at which I spoke. And uh, he doesn't look like John Travolta, but he does have that kind of presence. Very tall fellow in an expensive suit. And this is a scene where he is cross-examining one of the defendant's star witnesses, and it's about whether some property had been polluted and whether there was a cluster of leukemia as a result of this pollution. The, the uh, excerpt where Robert Duvall is talking is where Robert Duvall is a Harvard professor who's teaching a trial advocacy course who also happens to be defending the party for whom this witness is testifying. And Robert Duvall gives us some very valuable insight about what Jan Schlickman, played by John Travolta, is doing wrong. So if we'll roll this one. Hanging judge all put together. There is absolutely no place in a courtroom for pride. Mr. Riley, you own the property referred to often in this courtroom as the 15 acres, do you not? No, I don't. That land is currently owned by a nonprofit corporation called the Wildwood Conservancy. Oh, yes, yes, here it is, the Wildwood Conservancy. Now, what is that, some kind of conservation group? Yes, sir. I've donated the land as a sanctuary for indigent wildlife. <laughs> well, you know, I don't think the indigent wildlife has heard about this. Riley, I've been out there on several occasions, and I've yet to see a single bird or any other living thing. I get him to say, no, 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 no. Then he says, yes, once. Got him. He's not that stupid. You leave him up there long enough, he's going to figure out a way to get you. I'm not that stupid. Mr. Riley, experts have testified in this court that your land, your 15 acres, is the most grotesquely polluted land in all of New England. Now, you have no idea how it got that way? No, sir. Does it upset you to learn this? Very much so. Really? Why? And one last thing. Unless you know exactly what the answer is going to be, never, ever ask a witness why. My factory is the oldest surviving business in Woburn. When the other tanners moved out, I stayed. Even though for me, that was a very big financial burden. This is not the I question. I stayed because Woburn is my home. Mr. Riley, it's Your Honor, children. this is home. not the question. He's trying that to I, answer it, Mr. Slickman. Well, he's not answering just to let him. That land 
has been in my family for three generations. And obviously, Mr. Slickman made an error there. That was one why question that I'm sure he wished he hadn't have asked. And if you recall the book, that defendant offered $20 million in the verdict against that defendant came back as zero and they eventually settled with the other one for around eight million dollars. So whether that particular exchange was what did it, we'll never know, but it certainly didn't look good. So let's, we've talked about some, some theater about cross-examination. We've talked about the need for leading questions. I want to focus now on the topic, liar, liar, pants on fire. Impeachment. Well, I looked at Professor Irving Younger's tapes and I've read his stuff and I've read lots of stuff and I just couldn't think of any way to remember an acronym for impeachment so I invented one and if you'll show the uh, viewer here wham bam wham bam I'm getting ready to impeach you can impeach mostly by these six letters wham that's words actions and memories words would be Depositions, books, prior testimony, the words of others, actions. That would be an expert. Did he do the right test? Did he follow the right methodology? And in federal court, that's essential these days, methodology. From a lay witness, did they observe properly? Could they observe what they said they observed? Was their action sustainable as truth? Did they have the ability to see memory? Well, generally, we use words to prove that their memory wasn't right. Did, was your testimony six months ago better than it is now? Was your memory better? Things like that. But memory is an easy one. Bias. So that includes prejudice. Do they have an ax to grind? Are they getting paid a lot? Are they a company official? And I'll lump the last two. Attitude and manner. And that's when you cross-examine and impeach. Sometimes some witnesses are just jerks. And if you can show they're a jerk and take advantage of it, then you have impeached their credibility by proving that aspect of their character to the jury in a way that will destroy whatever they said on direct. I want to share with you, uh, before we show the verse, first vignette, the worst impeachment that I've ever had the unfortunate pleasure of being on the wrong side of. Real case tried in the state court of Bibb County. It was an automobile collision. The woman said that she had hurt her back quite seriously, and that was her representation to us. And we found no medical records from the doctors she identified and any we were able to chase down that impeached that. And after she was very adamant in direct testimony to establish how healthy she was before this car wreck, the cross-examination after a few introductories went something like this. Ms. Witness, you told us on direct, you'd never had a back injury, isn't that true? The witness, yes, that's true. Well, isn't it true that you broke your back in 1991? No, that's not true. Isn't it true that you fell through an attic floor and broke your back in 1991? No, never. Isn't it true that you fell through an attic floor, landed on a chest of drawers, and broke your back in 1991? No, that just didn't happen. Isn't it true that you fell through an attic floor, landed on a chest of drawers, and broke your back in 1991, and that you went to the Grady Hospital where you were x-rayed and told you had a broken back. No, sir. I went to the Georgia Baptist Hospital. Let's show this first one, which is a, um, a scene from The Rainmaker. And in this case, what I want you to look for is both the use of prior testimony, her testimony from direct, as well as the use of words of another person. We see this all the time in personal injury cases where they hold up a medical record that is not admissible in and of itself, but somehow get that record into evidence through the use of part of that record as cross-examination questions. Let's roll this tape and we'll see what they show. A year in the United States, less than 200 in the state of Tennessee. Objection. Your Honor, he, he's leading the witness. This is cross-examination. Leading is allowed, overruled as to leading. So it was not covered by the policy. Now, Mrs. Black, <clears throat> who was it, sir? Uh, who was it first diagnosed your son's condition? Well, at the very beginning, our doctor, Dr. Page. That would be your, your family physician? Yes, sir, it would. Is he a good doctor? He's a very good doctor. 
And is it not true, Mrs. Black, that this capable, truthful man told you repeatedly that a bone marrow transplant would do your son no good because of the type of leukemia he had? Well, no. No, he did not. He didn't say that. Not like that to me. Approach the witness, Your Honor. You may. Mrs. Black, is this not uh, Dr. Page's uh, letterhead? And at the bottom there, uh, that's not his signature. He can't do that. Yes, it is. And is this Why? letter not addressed? He can't to introduce me. evidence that way. Plus, it's hearsay. Yes, sir. Objection, Your Honor. A, a letter from, from the Black's family physician to Mr. Drummond is inadmissible. That is quite correct, Your Honor. And I'm not asking for this letter to be admitted into evidence. I'm simply asking that this witness be allowed to read the letter under Rule 612 of the Tennessee Rules of Evidence so her recollection can be refreshed, that's all. Mr. Beeler, what do you say? Uh, I, I don't know, Your Honor. I just object to this. And... And also, we were not furnished this letter in, in pretrial discovery. What do you say to that, Mr. Drummond? Your Honor, I had no idea this letter. What they had done there, and we see it all the time, he's taking a record that is indeed hearsay, which is indeed inadmissible, and they are thinking of a clever way, whether it's refresh recollection or whatever, to incorporate it into the cross-examination and impeach the witness. I think there's a little more on that particular uh, tape where we show the conclusion of this particular effort, if we can roll it. Two, but don't stray too far. Very well, Your Honor. Now, Mrs. Black, does that letter refresh your, your recollection as to whether or not Donnie Ray's leukemia was the kind that could be helped by bone marrow transplant? Well, see, now, he is not a specialist. But he is a licensed, experienced, capable physician who lovingly told you time and time again what you quite understandably did not want to accept that your son was going to die of leukemia despite the best efforts of medical science. Is that not true? But he wasn't a specialist. I didn't believe him. Not only did you not believe him, ma'am, but you were less than truthful with me and with this jury moments ago when you told us under oath that Dr. Page never said that your son had the type of leukemia that could not be treated by a bone marrow transplant. I believe your exact words were, he never said that. Not like that. Let's, uh, we're going to move to the next one, which is a, a clip from The Devil's Advocate. In The Devil's Advocate, we have Keanu Reeves playing this hotshot lawyer who's never lost a case. And he eventually consorts with the devil, who's played by the senior partner of some big New York law firm, appropriately, apparently. But he is defending a man accused in this opening scene of the movie he's defending a man accused of child molestation the child is on the stand the child is one of his students and Keanu Reeves is as the lawyer is using some words that the child has written to impeach her credibility um, as a as a witness if we can roll that one now Mr. Geddes no no never called him a Disgusting pig monster. Order. No. Your Honor, I pre-marked this defense exhibit A. Objection. Your Honor, we've had plenty of time for discovery here. I'm going to let this in, Mr. Lomax. I'm also going to suggest that if you have any other exhibits, you present in a timely fashion or not at all. I'm sorry, Barbara. I was wrong. It's huge hog beast. <laughs> this is your handwriting, isn't it? Yes. You wrote this in Mr. Getty's class. It's a joke. He's a huge hog beast. He probably eats a thousand pancakes for breakfast. <laughs> You're writing here about Mr. Getty's, aren't you? It was meant to be a joke. Have you ever had a party at your house, Barbara? When your parents were away? Objection. I, your Honor, this is way out of Credibility line. and... What we learned from that, and I'm not sure I, any one of us would really cross-examine a child quite so viciously, but the point, what we learn is not only the use of the word, but you notice the setup. If you're going to impeach somebody with words, there has to be a setup. And I want you to, uh, to look in the uh, materials that we provided 
And Howard Nations, I just quoted a bunch of his stuff in there, but he's talking about using the deposition. And we've all tried to use depositions or had them used against our clients in trial. And the thing that lawyers do wrong over and over and over is they fail to do the wind-up. They get so excited about the pitch that they don't warm up. There's no wind-up. You've got to do the wind-up. You've got to say, do you remember testifying in this case? Or have you ever testified that up was down or that black was white? And they, of course, will say yes or no. Do you remember this case? Do you remember on this date where you were? Do you remember being under oath? And what Howard's Nations talks about is what I was talking about earlier. Think about the theater of this moment. Think about where you want to stand when, that, when you give them that deposition so that the jury is focusing on them when they read, yes, on a previous occasion, I said exactly the opposite of what I said today. And that's exactly what we saw Keanu Reeves do there. Have you ever said it? No, I haven't. Boom. There was the impeachment with the setup. That's an essential aspect of impeachment by cross-examination through the use of words. This next vignette is in cross-examination by the use of lack of words. Lack of words. In cases like Claudia was, was discussing with us earlier today, we often have owner's manuals, driver's manuals, instruction manuals. And what the defense will say, or the witness will say, well, that's not in the regulations. That's not a duty imposed on me. It's not in the regulations. And I think what we're going to see from this scene of, in A Few Good Men is that just because it's not in the regulation might not have a whole lot of weight in support of their testimony. If we can roll this clip from A Few Good Men. Sir, have you read it? Yes, sir. Good. Would you turn to the chapter that deals with code reds, please? Sir? Just flip to the page of the book that discusses code reds. Well, well you see, sir, code red is a term that we use. I mean, just down at Gitmo. I don't know if Oh, it's we're luck then. Standard operating procedure, rifle security company, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Now, I assume we'll find the term code red in its definition in that book. Am I correct? No, sir. No? Corporal Barnes, I'm a Marine. Is there no book, no manual or pamphlet, no set of orders or regulations that lets me know that as a Marine, one of my duties is to perform code reds? No, sir. No book, sir. No further question. Corporal, would you turn to the page in this book that says where the mess hall is, please? <laughs> well, Lieutenant Caffey, that's not in the book, sir. Well, you mean to say in all your time at Gitmo, you've never had a meal? No, sir. Three squares a day, sir. I don't understand. How did you know where the mess hall was if it's not in this book? Point being, it's the exact same thing. How do you know to drive reasonably if it's not in your book? How do you know to keep your logbook properly if it's not in your book? You can use these as impeachment to just show that their direct is ridiculous, their reliance on the written word is ridiculous. This next, we've, we've talked about some words. Let's go to the next wham bam acronym letter, and that's actions. One of the best ways that uh, we can show action is, it's hard to find any movies on this, uh, it, it, what's great fun is with an expert is to take things he's written. Um, I have some video that I would have run out of time, but we, we had a cross-examination of an expert on an ergonomics issue. And I had the expert bring his entire library, knowing that ergonomics books say everything. We stacked the books to the right of him, and we had gone through all these books and marked the pages. And we went through one book at a time and said, turn to page 306. Isn't that exactly the opposite of what you said? Well, 308 was also in support of what he said. But the point being, using the words one book at a time, we move the books from these are the books you relied on to these are the books that support us. Again, you're thinking of theater, and you're thinking of using words that he relied upon as an expert to impeach him. Now we're going to show more uh, classic impeachment with respect to did they have the ability to see? Was the action of their ability to see? Um, so let's, uh, this is a vignette from that really intellectual movie, My Cousin Vinny. I earlier that the boys went into the store and you had just begun to make breakfast. You were just ready to eat and you heard a gunshot. That's right, I'm sorry. So obviously it takes you five minutes to make breakfast. That's right. All right, so you knew that. Uh, Do you remember what you had? Eggs and grits. Eggs and grits. I like grits too. 
How do you cook your grits? You like them regular, creamy, or al dente? Just regular, I guess. Regular. Instant grits? No self-respecting Southerner uses instant grits. I take pride in my grits. So, Mr. Tipton, how could it take you five minutes to cook your grits when it takes the entire grit-eating world 20 minutes? I don't know. I'm a fast cook, I guess. I'm sorry, I was all the way over here. I couldn't hear you. Did you say you're a fast cook? That's it? Are we to believe that boiling water soaks into a grit faster in your kitchen than on any place on the face of the earth? I don't know. Well, perhaps the laws of physics cease to exist on your stove. Were these magic grits? I mean, did you buy them from the same guy who sold Jack his beanstalk beans? Oh, uh, yeah, objection, Your Honor. Objection sustained. Are you Mr. sure about Tipton, that five minutes? Ignore the question. Know. Are you sure about Did that five? couple of things to learn there. One is he's asking questions, even his open-ended questions, you know the answer to. We know you can't cook grits in five minutes. He knew that as a fact. So it was okay to ask the open-ended question. From a theater point of view, where was he looking? Where was the jury's attention when he asked the important question? He's right there in front of the jurors. He was the star because the question was the star, not the witness. We're going to, um, I think there's another vignette from that, this same movie. Uh, to give you a little background, two kids are accused of uh, killing somebody in a convenience store. The first witness said he had five minutes. They were in and out. Obviously, it was 20 minutes. This next witness says she saw them do it, and they were several hundred feet away. And let's show an in-courtroom in courtroom demonstration as part of cross-examination to show that her actions could not have been what she said. No. How far were the defendants from you when you saw them entering the sack of suds? About a hundred feet. A hundred feet. Would you hold this, please? Thank you. Sorry. Excuse me. Excuse me. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. This is 50 feet. That's half the distance. How many fingers am I holding up? Let the record show that counsel is holding up two fingers. Your Honor, please, huh? Oh. Sorry. Now, Mrs. Riley, and only Mrs. Riley, how many fingers am I holding up now? Well, she didn't have any idea. Obviously, you need to be awfully sure before you try any in-courtroom experimentation. But the point is, that's the way you do it if you know what the answer is going to be. I, I couldn't find anything good on memory. We all know you use words on memory. You want to attack their age on memory, et cetera. So let's go to bias. Does the witness have an ax to grind? Is there a way that you can establish to impeach them Generally, people think impeachment is they said black, the answer is they really said white at some other time. But I think impeachment includes attacking their credibility in a way that everything they say is unbelievable. And one of the beauties of this kind of impeachment is it, is, it can hurt the opposite side's entire case. So let's roll this from uh, the Rainmaker, and we will show that prejudice can be a powerful method, bias can be a powerful uh, impeachment tool that you have recently been committed to an institution for various problems. I was not committed. I am suffering from alcoholism and depression. I and I voluntarily checked into a facility. I was supposed to be covered by my group policy at great benefit, and they, of course, are denying my claim. Is that why you're here, Ms. Magic? Because you're angry with great benefit? I Ms. Magic? I hate great benefit and most of the worms that work there. Did you feel Mr. Lufkin was a worm when you were sleeping with him? Objection. Your Honor, 
Mr. Drummond might find this fun to talk about, but uh, this is not relevant at all. Oh, there's no fun for me. Overruled. Let's see what this takes us. You admit to having an affair with Mr. Lufkin? Mr. Magic? As long as I had sex with certain executives at great benefit, my pay was increased and I was promoted. When I stopped, I was demoted. There's a magic. As an employee of great benefit, you promise not to disclose <coughs> confidential private claims information. Yes? Yes. In fact, you testified that you sealed that promise by demand of payments for $10,000. That payment was not my idea. But you accepted it, didn't you? You put it right in your pocketbook. Even though in your mind, you never intended to keep that promise. In fact, you were very angry at great benefit at Mr. Lufkin, weren't you? You know, they preyed on me because I was broke and I was single and I had two kids. So you told him you're going to go to his wife, go to the newspapers, and that $10,000, that, that was just a piece of blackmail, wasn't it? A way to extort money from the company you hated. Isn't that right? No, that's not In right. fact, your testimony here today is just a lie. You stole company work papers, confidential reports, and blackmail for revenge. What's interesting here is that the lawyer didn't really care what her answers were. Isn't that right? She said no. He didn't care. And that's essential on cross-examination. Certain questions, you really don't care. The point is to get the question across, get it across powerfully, and take control of that witness. We're going to now move to attitude and manner. And I think attitude and manner in many ways is a subset of bias. But there are witnesses who just are flat disagreeable. They are so scared of cross-examination that they are convinced that whatever you ask them, they better disagree with. And there are also witnesses who have this attitude that they're just going to beat you. I've got two scenes that I think illustrate this fairly entertainingly and perhaps a little bit effectively. The first is from The People versus Larry Flint. Larry Flint being the publisher of Hustler Magazine. And in this vignette, Mr. Flint and Hustler Magazine are being accused of slander of Jerry Falwell. They had accused Mr. Falwell in a cartoon of having sex with his mother in an outhouse and preaching drunk. And so obviously the defense to slander is, one of the defenses would be, that no reasonable person could possibly have believed it. Well, the way that the lawyer for Hustler Magazine and Mr. Flint handled this was to first build up Mr. Falwell own ego and then take advantage of it and I think we see that done right here. In poll of a Good Housekeeping magazine I was voted second most admired American behind President Reagan. Good housekeeping? That's, that's, I mean hey you're famous, right? Well I suppose you could say that. Mm -hmm. Reverend Falwell, have you ever had sex with your mother? Absolutely not. Never? I mean, you never, never in the outhouse, as Hustler magazine suggested? That is an absurd question. My mother was a, a very godly woman, and as close to a saint as anyone I have ever known. I'm sure she was. Reverend, have you ever preached while you were drunk? Drunk? Yes. Never. Never. Huh. I mean, you never even had a few too many at lunch and then went back on the radio once? That is a totally outrageous suggestion. Totally outrageous? Totally. You don't think that some people, Reverend Falwell, despite your reputation, might have reason to believe that you could do that? I would find that very difficult to believe. So really what you're telling me is that nobody could reasonably think that these statements about you were true. That pretty much gutted the libel and slammer case. And he did that by taking advantage of the man's ego. And that goes to this attitude and manner aspect of wham bam impeachment. Uh, this last vignette is, I think, a more famous use of attitude. In this case, we are looking at an excerpt from A Few Good Men. And if you'll recall, we've seen an excerpt from this earlier. Two Marines are accused of beating someone to death during a code red, which was a disciplinary action. 
at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. Uh, Jack Nicholson plays the commanding colonel of that base, and he is full of himself. From the get-go, they know that he's full of himself, and Tom Cruise is, is risking his profession because he's got nothing else on this cross-examination other than his gut feeling that this witness will crack because his attitude and manner is such that if you push him to the wall, he'll just tell you to go to hell. And that's exactly what he does. So let's watch this. What's that? I'd appreciate if he would dress me as Colonel or Sir. I believe I've earned it. Defense counsel will address the witness as Colonel or Sir. I don't know what the hell kind of unit you're running here. And the witness will address this court as Judge or Your Honor. I'm quite certain I've earned it. Take your seat, Colonel. What do you want to discuss now? My favorite color? Colonel, the 6 a.m. flight was the first one off the base? Yes. There wasn't a flight that left seven hours earlier and landed at Andrews Air Force Base at 2 a.m.? Lieutenant, I think we've covered this, haven't we? I think we can continue this particular one. A moment ago, you said that you ordered Lieutenant Kendrick to tell his men that Santiago wasn't to be touched. That's right. And Lieutenant Kendrick was clear on what you wanted? Crystal. Any chance Lieutenant Kendrick ignored the order? Ignored the order? Any chance he forgot about it? No. Any chance Lieutenant Kendrick left your office and said, the old man is wrong? No. When Lieutenant Kendrick spoke to the platoon and ordered them not to touch Santiago, any chance they ignored him? You ever served in an infantry unit, son? No, sir. Ever served in a forward area? No, sir. Ever put your life in another man's hands? Asked him to put his life in yours? No, sir. We follow orders, son. We follow orders or people die. It's that simple. Are we clear? Yes, sir. Are we clear? Crystal. Colonel, I have just one more question before I call Airman O'Malley and Airman Rodriguez. If you gave an order that Santiago wasn't to be touched, and your orders are always followed, then why would Santiago be in danger? Why would it be necessary to transfer him off the base? Santiago was a substandard Marine. He was being transferred. That's not what you said. You said he was being transferred because he was in grave danger. That's correct. You right. said he was in danger. I said grave danger. You said, is there I any recall other... what I said. I can have the court reporter read back to you. I know what I said. I don't have to have it read back to me like I'm... Why did you orders? Colonel? Sometimes men take matters into their own hands. No, sir. You made it clear just a moment ago that your men never take matters in their own hands. Your men follow orders or people die. So Santiago shouldn't have been in any danger at all, should he have, Colonel? You snotty little bastard. Your Honor, I'd like to ask for a recess. I'd like an answer to the question, Judge. The court will wait for an answer. If Lieutenant Kendrick gave an order that Santiago wasn't to be touched, then why did he have to be transferred? Colonel? Lieutenant Kendrick ordered the code red, didn't he? Because that's what you told Lieutenant Kendrick to do. Object! And when it went bad, you cut crazy. these guys loose! Your Honor, you have more inside the phone you Your Honor, Honor, you doctored the logbook! Damn it, Captain! You coerced the doctor! Consider Your yourself Honor, in contempt! You. Colonel Jackson, did you order the code red? You don't have to answer that question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled to You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Son, we live in a world that has walls, and those walls have to be guarded by men with guns. Who's going to do it? You? You, Lieutenant Weinberg? I have a greater responsibility than you can possibly fathom. You weep for Santiago, and you curse the Marines. You have that luxury. You have the luxury of not knowing what I know, that Santiago's death, while tragic, probably saved lives. And my existence, while grotesque and incomprehensible to you, saves lives. You don't want the truth because deep down in places you don't talk about at parties. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. 
We use words like honor, code, loyalty. We use these words as the backbone of a life spent defending something. You use them as a punchline. I have neither the time nor the inclination to explain myself to a man who rises and sleeps under the blanket of the very freedom that I provide and then questions the manner in which I provide it. I would rather you just said thank you and went on your way. Otherwise, I suggest you pick up a weapon and stand a post. Either way, I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. Did you order the code red? I did the job. Did you order the code red? You're goddamn right I did! That kind of cross-examination, obviously, is a lot more exciting in the movies, but in real life, there are designers of products, there are company safety officials who will take that exact same stance. They are with incapable of flaws, and when you push them, push them, push them, you will either get them to show their butt in such a way that is ridiculous, or they'll finally come around your way, because they will have said something that is so ridiculous that it is, it is undefendable. If I have 40 seconds more, I'll share my last thoughts. I pulled this off the internet. I don't know who wrote it. Things you learn about trials in the movies. I'll share this with you, and this is my closing comments. A pretty good strategy if you're a criminal defense attorney is get a witness up on the stand and ask him if he did it. Eventually, he'll say he did. Good time to figure out how you're going to win a case is in the middle of questioning a witness. If you put a witness up and the other lawyer is mean to them, call it badgering. It's right there in the rule book, no badgering. Defending a client you suspect is guilty of something is a shocking ethical dilemma in a defense attorney's life, one which we rarely find ourselves in. Lawyers spend most of their time in court. Things like writing documents or being on the phone, not to mention research, are basically brief interruptions from our constant excitement of jury trials. If your brother gets shot, there's a special procedure by which you can get yourself appointed the prosecutor. Discovery schmovery. If your closing argument takes longer than 30 seconds, you're really overdone it. That's really just your opportunity to tell your jury why you should win in favor of your guy. Mostly when you talk to a judge, what you want to make are broad, moral, public policy arguments, things like, this is wrong, this is really wrong, this is a gross miscarriage of justice. And while the other lawyer is questioning witnesses, it's a good idea to make lots of faces to convey how you think he's doing. If he really makes a good point and you're surprised, burying your face in your hands is suggested. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this cross-examination by fire. And if you remember hi-ho and wham-bam, maybe you'll be a little more effective the next time you're in court. Thanks. Any questions? Oh, any questions? Yes, I did have to watch a lot of movies.